Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Fredericton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Honourable uh, Parliamentary Secretary for the Prime Minister for splitting his time with me today. It is absolutely a, a pleasure, as it always is, to be here with you all, and I'm delighted to see some of you for the first time in months. I really did miss you all. <laughs> Um, but once again, it wasn't easy getting here, and I did pack up my family. Uh, we drove here from New Brunswick, and they're, they're with me for the long haul, so we'll be here as long as we need to do uh, the work of Parliament that I also feel is, is, is very critical and essential during this time. I do think of all the MPs who are not here today, and it is not because they don't want to be here or that they're not working. As I look at this chamber, 30 or so of us spread out with several seats between us, and I'm reminded that each empty chair represents roughly 100,000 Canadians, and their voices will not be heard here today. Certain members of this House believe that perhaps a responsible representation of MPs by party status is adequate for decision-making and questioning the government. But let us not forget that our jobs are first and foremost to our constituents and not to our parties. I am delighted to be here on behalf of the riding of Fredericton, raising the issues that are important to them. And like the member for, for Foothills, it is also the thrill of my lifetime to be elected a member of this House, to stand here in this historic place, a symbol of our freedom and democracy. It is a place of honour and respect, yet there have been some disrespectful comments made, insinuations that our fellow members are not showing up to work because they cannot be here in person. We have heard wartime anecdotes, quotes of Winston Churchill, among others, all suggesting that COVID-19 in the year 2020 is somehow the same as World War II or the influenza outbreak. But of course, we know this is not the case. The word unprecedented has been used an unprecedented amount of times to describe the situation that faces us. We do not see the forces of the world clashing under ty tyrannical regimes. We do not have bombs bursting overhead. We face an invisible enemy, one that does not discriminate, one that affects its hosts at a rate we have never seen before, and one that has left our communities vulnerable. We most certainly have an essential role to play as parliamentarians, but one that looks different than any other time in our history. The motion put before us asks us to be creative, collaborative, and accommodating to our members of parliament, and I believe it is meant to allow fulsome participation of all elected members of this house from all ridings across this great country. Few other MPs from Atlantic Canada are able to be here today. That is concerning to me. The issues facing my home region are urgent and unique. Right now, our region of Canada is facing challenges with the lobster season, quotas for fishers, processors unable to recruit enough workers, temporary foreign workers were only allowed in New Brunswick as of last Friday, meaning a delayed season with major implications for the economy and for the agricultural yields. There are also calls for a public inquiry into the handling of the port Peck tragedy and the broader conversation that has started about support for mental health initiatives and our collective response to domestic violence, especially in rural areas. Cities, towns, and villages in Atlantic Canada are much smaller than the major urban centres of other provinces, meaning that some of the federal funding earmarked for New Brunswick, PEI, and even Nova Scotia cannot be implemented by the municipalities that need it most. And let us not forget New Brunswick's unique role as a bilingual province and the challenges that have been faced by Canada's minority francophone population to receive accurate current information about the virus. We also see that New Brunswick is one of the most enviable jurisdictions in the world in terms of its total number of cases and zero deaths. Finally, it pays to be a New Brunswicker. Canada should be watching closely as my home province continues to open up elements of its economy as a test case for which businesses will flourish post-COVID-19 which will need continued support. These issues are regionally specific and deserve to be voiced, and most of the MPs representing those voices cannot be here due to restrictions on interprovincial travel, limited domestic flights, and the requirement for pared-down numbers in Parliament. I also note that it is not safe for other members of this House, the ones who are from isolated communities, the ones for whom their health or that of their... Ooh, drop something or that of their communities could be put at greater risk of contracting COVID-19 by traveling to Ottawa. For those that cannot be here today, how can we ask them to risk becoming vectors of transmission? At the same time, how can we hope to make decisions and represent Canada without a single voice from these vulnerable regions? It remains my opinion that until we can have full integration of the virtual with the in-person meetings of the Chamber or Special Committee, we are doing a disservice to rural, northern, Atlantic and West Coast Canadians. As we stand here today, we are not ensuring equal representation for Canada, which is one of our most fundamental principles. 
Having said that, I see the effort the government is making with this motion to integrate virtual par participation with the in-person sittings. I also recognize that today-to-day -to -day sittings will be special committee on the COVID-19 pandemic, rather than full sittings of the House of Commons, which would be more ideal. With these elements considered, I will be supporting the motion because I believe it is in the best interest of democracy at this time. When we have figured out how the full virtual integration of MPs will work, we will need to see the House reconvene to table some pressing legislation. Medical assistance in dying. In February, the Minister of Justice asked the Supreme Court for a four-month extension to the ruling in order to avoid the creation of separate MAID frameworks in Quebec and the rest of Canada. We have already taken advantage of an extension. Difficult issues still need to be addressed, and Canadians who wish to receive MAID depend on us to pass that legislation. In March, the government introduced legislation to criminalize the cruel practice of conversion therapy. We need to commit to ban that practice without further delay. We also need to see the specifics of the firearms legislation, meant to accompany the regulatory changes made on May 1st. Canadians need to see the full details of this plan to end the supposition that is polarizing Canadians. Figuring out the integration of virtual MPs with those of us here in person enables us to lead the way for Canada as the world of work shifts permanently through this period in history. Some Canadians will need to continue working from home for some time to come. Some will want to continue working from home. Some will need to work from home partially and partially at their offices. We're being creative. We will see less travel by plane. We will see less commuter traffic in general. Let us set the example for workplaces across the nation, enabling MPs to make the best decisions for their constituents and engage fully in the debate and decision making that occurs in this House. My hope is that all Canadians know how hard we are working for them every day. Whether that is in our living rooms, with our kids hanging off of us in front of a Zoom screen, or here on the floor of the House of Commons, our commitment and our efforts are unwavering. For me, my mind is constantly on those I know still slipping, are still slipping through the cracks of our COVID relief initiatives. The not-for-profits, the charities and church groups who for one reason or another find themselves ineligible for the wage subsidy program, despite the critical services they provide in our communities. The cleaners and cashiers that have been left out of the essential workers' wage top-up in New Brunswick. Dentists concerned about their practices moving forward and finding barriers to procuring PPE. The international students who still do not qualify for the student benefit, who have nowhere to go and no support. The pregnant women who still do not have adequate answers about the parental leave benefits in the weeks to come. And so many others. I work for you. My colleagues work for you. And I know we can continue to do this work in a way that protects the health and safety of our home communities. Thank you. Questions and comments. Question commentaire, the Honourable Member, Alain la Député de lac saint -Louis. Thank you, I enjoyed listening to the Honourable Member's speech. Um, and I, 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 I focused uh, a bit on, on what uh, she was saying regarding the fact that we are here to represent our constituents uh, first and, and parties second. Of course, our system uh, works uh, uh, um, along party lines, that, that's normal and good. But uh, I've heard a lot uh, from the other side about how we could just solve this problem by having voting rotations. And uh, I understand the uh, intuitive appeal of that, but when I heard the uh, member's speech, I thought, well, what if you're not on a rotation on a bill, on voting on a bill that is particularly important to you and your whip, uh, whomever, and we have a wonderful whip, I'm, I'm not uh, casting aspersions on our wonderful whip, but what if you don't, uh, what if you really um, uh, insist on being in the House because you want to take a stand on that particular issue because it's important to your constituents? How does a rotation preserve your parliamentary privilege? The member for Fredericton. Thank you, and I, I thank the member for his question. And you're absolutely right, it doesn't protect our parliamentary pr privilege. We have the right to be here and to voice our concerns on every issue that's put before this House. And being from a small party, I actually have many, many critic files, so I have broader interests than perhaps other members um, and responsibilities, so I want to participate in, in everything that goes on. So I really feel that this is a it's, it, it shows our ability to collaborate. We are being creative. We are being accommodating. I think this needs to move forward. And I think it's something that we can be excited about. I think this is a very neat initiative. Uh, I think Canadians will be excited to see how this works. And other jurisdictions are already doing this. So I think it's time that uh, we give it a shot and, and a real good you know, effort. And, and I think our attitudes need to shift a bit. Thank you very much. 
Guests say come on to that. Questions and comments. Honourable Member for Saskatoon, Grasswood. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the Honourable Member from New Brunswick. Uh, New Brunswick, uh, like Saskatchewan, is well ahead of the curve. We've done very well in our provinces. Uh, I can see Ontario and Quebec uh, need to catch up to the two provinces I just mentioned. But I will say one thing, um, and she being a new member in the House, Mr. Speaker, private members' bills uh, will not go forward. We're going to miss almost a full year of private member bills in the House of Commons. This is an important privilege for members right. to bring their their issues forward and uh, Mr. Speaker I just wanted to know her view on private member bills being shut down until the fall and maybe even longer than that. Honourable Member for Fredericton. Thank you Mr. Speaker and I thank my colleague for the question and, and you're right. Um, yesterday when you were speaking about private members bills I found myself nodding my head quite a bit. It is a, a critical component of what we do here in this house um, and it is an unfortunate um, aspect of, of this new motion that that wouldn't be included. I was not lucky enough to, to win the lottery. My number is quite a bit uh, farther down the line, and that's perhaps why um, I'm more willing to support this. Um, but it, it's not fair to my other colleagues who do have private members' bills that they'd like to put forward. So you're right. It, it, we, it isn't perfect. It's not, it's not the ideal situation, but we do have to do um, what's best for, for the health of our communities. And unfortunately, uh, private members' bills won't fit into what was being proposed here today. Thank you. Question and comment. Honorable Deputy de Shepherd. Je remercie ma collègue pour son discours et elle a abordé la question dans notamment des violences familiales. Alors j'aimerais l'entendre si dans certains cas, il y a certains programmes dans sa province et au Québec qui pourraient peut-être permettre à davantage de femmes de se sortir de situations de violence en cette période de crise, mais que les provinces et le Québec sont les mieux pour être capables parfois dans certains programmes de reconnaître leurs compétences. La députée de Fredericton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the honourable colleague for for her question and just as an ally as well um, for women and, and about domestic violence and there's, we're certainly doing all that we can and it, it's difficult uh, across jurisdictions and, and, and we need to be very regionally specific because there are a lot of cultural things to take into consideration around this issue um, and that's one of the important things that we want to discuss here in this house but also to allow all of our colleagues across Canada to join us through virtual parliament as well. So um, I'm open to any idea that allows a fulsome participation of all voices to address very serious issues like domestic violence in Canada. Thank you. Time for a very short question. The Honourable Member for London Fanshawe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, and I did enjoy my, my colleague's speech today. She is very, very thoughtful, and I, I always really enjoy listening to her. But I wanted to ask specifically where we're here. We're talking about return to work, um, how or, or a continuation of work, and, and how things have to change. She talked about her, her family and, and recognized that a lot of people are, are dealing with um, um, issues at home where they have to balance uh, home and, 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 and work life. So as we talk about that, that return to work, obviously the NDP are working on... on better ways, paid sick leave, is, it's a huge part, but I would also like her to, to maybe respond to how we move forward in, in a, a more supportive way on childcare and a universal federally supported childcare system. A short response, the Honourable Member for Fredericton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I thank my Honourable colleague for the question. Um, Schools are closed, daycares are closed, my children are with me. Um, it, it has presented many challenges along the way. That perhaps has been the biggest uh, barrier or is, is kind of the, the work-home life balance. Um, as I said, Zoom conferences, my, my, child are, <laughs> my children are often entering the, the screen, but it's added a bit of an element of, of humanism to our, our work as well. Um, but absolutely, there have been increased costs associated with daycares reopening. We need to be considerate of, of affordability for Canadians across this country. If we want our economy to get back to, to work, we need daycares to be there for them and for it to be a Affordable. Thank you. 